New information tonight. When you think of moonshine, this probably comes to mind. Stills in the woods, a secret family recipe, all of it against the law. But a couple of brothers want to change that. They were the first to get a permit for a legal moonshine distillery in South Carolina, and it's about to open in downtown Anderson. So Corn, that's the main ingredient behind a brand new business. Palmetto Moonshine is opening in a 100-year-old building, and they're cranking out mason jar after mason jar of 105-proof white lightning. If I didn't have to make it far out in the mountains, down by the river, why not make it behind the courthouse? And so here we are. Brothers Brian and Trey Boggs have been working on this for a year. One night I was thinking, I was like, why does the federal government hate moonshine so bad? And it hit me, taxes. So we thought, well, what if we paid the taxes on it? That started the process of getting this place running. Thanks to a 2009 law, it was all possible. Now their distillery and shop is a reality. In this screened room, there are containers holding the mash, the starting point for moonshine. It's just fermenting. The yeast is in there eating the corn sugars, and that creates the alcohol. It sits for a couple of weeks before being poured into the heart of the operation, a handmade copper still. The mash is put in here, is heated up, uh, used about a half a million BTU burners. Um, once the mash is heated up, it vaporizes and it goes through the hat into the thumper. The thumper double cooks the mixture to make it extra smooth, and from there it goes into the worm, a chiller that takes the alcohol from a vapor form into a liquid. And then of course it exits here, and this is where we'll be catching it, and then we'll take it back for processing in the kitchen. That's where it's put in jars that end up on the shelves for sale for $35 each. We're at 105 proof, a little bit higher than most, but it's actually that kind of breaking point where it's still good and smooth and it doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, you couldn't smoke a cigarette and catch yourself on fire. So, like any good reporter, I wanted to test it for myself. Let me get a little sip here. It's really good. <laughs> it's strong, but it's very, very smooth. And let me try the blackberry too. Oh, you definitely have like a sweeter taste with that. Yeah, there's a lot of rebels out there that will drink it on the rocks, but then you can also mix it with many other mixed things that makes it great. And it's a chance to try something that gives you a taste of history with a modern twist. For those people that don't want to break the law, now they can come in here and buy it legal just like a regular liquor store. And Palmetto Moonshine is opening tomorrow on Benson Street, just off South Murray Avenue in downtown Anderson. They will have moonshine, of course, along with music, the Budweiser beer wagon, and food. There are a couple of other flavors besides the original. You saw me just taste the blackberry. They also have peach and apple pie. Those they're in the process of trying out. I tasted it at that point, but uh, wanted to share it as well with Trent and Kendra. Woo. Now, just... If you smell cheers. it, okay, cheers. If yes. you smell <laughs> to winning the lottery, you mm -hmm. know that um, you know it's strong. Like it's notice. 105 proof. I've already had my taste. Okay. If you guys just want to give a little little taste on your tongue, a very small one because we have a news finish. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> left eye. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? All right. We might not have a weather cast tonight. I don't know, no, but I see what you mean. It's it's smooth. It's not right. really. Well, I just I couldn't drink much of that stuff, that's for sure. Well, you have to, you know, what they were saying is you have to mix it with other things. Right. So some people are brave enough and they're rebels, like yeah. you said, to, to drink it straight. That's a really but... good story, and I was impressed with you trying both flavors. Did you like the blackberry uh, better? I'm, I always like a little fruitier drink better, so definitely. It's only for professional reasons. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. No.
I'm Billy Ray Cyrus. When you grow up in a small town in the foothills of the Appalachians like I did, it doesn't take long to realize that some folks can't separate fact from fiction when it comes to southern mountain culture. That's what this show's all about. The reality behind those stereotypes that people have about my home and my people. One of the most indelible characters in American folklore is the moonshiner. He's usually portrayed as a simple fellow, skunked of his own liquor. But the truth is much more complex. Going back 300 years, moonshine whiskey has deep roots in American history. This potent clear liquid has come to symbolize tradition, rebellion, and survival. And few people embody those traits more than this man. White lightning, brown mule, I've heard it called, and painter piss, who shot Sally. They call it a whole bunch of names. But I be aware of anybody that comes around me wanting to know if I've got any white liquor. That word offends me. And anybody that says that, you better be aware of them because it could be the law. Meet a living legend among mountain men, Popcorn Sutton. He's been distilling whiskey in the North Carolina backcountry for 60 years. Popcorn may look like a character out of central casting, but make no mistake about it, he's the real deal. How many runs of liquor I've made in my life? Well, there ain't no way I could count it. I, I've made more runs of liquor than our whiskers on my jaw. Popcorn's prized liquor is made from a deceptively simple recipe. Mix corn, water, yeast, and sugar. Let the mixture ferment until a mash is formed. Heat the mash up in a copper steel. Cool it down and turn it back to liquid and you've got shine. Perfecting this craft has been Popcorn's life calling. It's just something that's come up in me since I was a little old kid. You know, a lot of people, they dream of what they're going to have years, years later and while they go do this and do that. My thing was liquor, and that's just what I done. Moonshining's a Sutton family tradition, and so is defying the law. Popcorn's grandfather was jailed for the crime back in 1929, and Popcorn's been busted twice over the years. Even if they get caught, and, and some of them get caught, you know, three, four, five times. And, and they just continue on doing it. Uh, and they're probably never going to stop doing it. Uh, it's just, it's in their blood and not going to stop. Moonshine was not an American invention, but in the earliest years of the United States of America, making it a statement of rebellion certainly was. When immigrants settled the Appalachian frontier in the early 1700s, they carried with them centuries-old recipes for usquebaugh, or whiskey, from Northern Ireland and Scotland. Moonshine, as it came to be called, became an integral part of life in these southern mountains. Everybody drank it. Rum was the favorite in the early colonies, but when the Scottish settlers moved over, it was whiskey, water of life. As the Scots-Irish frontiersmen spread south through the wilderness, one of the few possessions they brought with them on the difficult journey was distilling equipment. This water of life was drink, medicine, and currency. For people who lived up in the hills, they could either grow this corn, sell bushels of it at the market, or it was much easier to distill it down into these you know, small containers easier to transport, and you make a whole lot more money. What started the, probably the whiskey making in this area probably was the Scotch-Irish settlers who came here, mostly from Ireland, and they, some of them had been making whiskey and their four parents before that for generations, so it wasn't anything new with them. It's just that when they got to America, the ingredients were a little bit different. We use corn here, where over there they had maybe some other kind of ingredient. But they knew how to make it, they knew how to drink it. It was a great commodity. It was easily divided, improved with age, and with a few barrels, you could buy a farm or two, or like, uh, like Abraham Lincoln's 
father, when they moved out of Kentucky into Illinois, I think with a, Illinois, I think with a couple of barrels of whiskey, he bought they, a farm. They started doing land office sweeps through this area, finding uh, stills that weren't simply stills, they were factories. I remember one in uh, Transylvania County that was underground. The whole thing was underground. It was like a little city down there. You know, and the, the liquor coming out on the end of the run and coming out continually. A lot of the people uh, felt like that it was easy money, you know. And, uh, but it's not easy money. I don't know, if, you know, how much people know about making moonshine, but it's hard work. Uh, first off, you try to find a secluded area where there's running water. Well, if it's secluded, it means it's a good distance from your home or anybody else's home. And then comes your ingredients. You've got to carry in uh, uh, maybe 50 pound, 100 pound, or 200 pound of, uh, of corn, ground corn, uh, and of course sugar, and other ingredients that you need to make whiskey with. Uh, so it, it begins to be a lot of work. The moonshine is less common than it used to be? My hell, you can't find it no more. I mean, decent liquor's gone. Because ain't nobody gonna work this hard what you've seen me work today anymore. What about the moonshine you can get for five bucks for a quart or whatever, you know? Five, five dollars a half gallon? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't want to drink none of it, because I'd say it'd take hair off a wooden leg. So, the, that stuff may, isn't made the same way that you're making it here? Oh, no. They use sheet metal pots and put rubbing alcohol in it. I wouldn't do no such a thing as that. If I do, I, I'd just quit. The, the fascination is with the little guy, the little underdog. And he's construed as the underdog, of course, when the, all the police are after him and this kind of thing. And he's off in the woods there alone at night making whiskey in, by a creek bed. Then he's the underdog, you know. Rebellion, you don't tell me what to do. I don't live by your rules. Uh, I didn't ask you to sanction my life. I don't need you to tell me how to live my life. There's a bad streak of that, or a good streak, in mountain culture. Cause you see, there ain't a thing here that I didn't pay for it. Paid taxes on the copper, paid taxes on the sugar, on the jars. I didn't steal nothing, so I don't think I broke the law anywhere. Well, I tell you what, my granddaddy helped build uh, the first Baptist church was built on Hemp Hill. He made liquor, and, and he took the liquor and sold it, and then took the money and helped buy the materials it took to build the first Baptist church on Hemp Hill that was ever built. I guess no matter what kind of, how you get your money, I mean, if you put it in the right place, I guess, the good Lord probably bless you for it anyway. Whether you got it selling taters or making liquor, don't matter, don't reckon. You know, if you go all the way back to, I remember reading Harriet Arno's, uh, she's got a marvelous book about what it was like before whiskey was taxed, when people did have a steal on the porch or uh, behind the house. You know, for years and years, for decade after decade, it was, there was no change in the, in the public's attitude toward whiskey making. I mean, everybody did it. At that time, there was no stigma attached to it at all, and people made moonshine uh, just as they would uh, grow any other crop. And then the taxis came, and it receded, and it had to hide. <laughs>